Joining us now, former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, is with us. Mr. Speaker, um, I watched the president decisively take action last night, and I felt that, you know, if the world is not going to respond to weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological agents being used against men, women, and children, and we don't send a message that it, this is not something the world can accept, and he was willing to go against Russia, the ally of Syria, to do this, if this doesn't show that we have a very different mindset in the White House, I don't know what will. Well, I think that that's one of the reasons he had to do it. He, he was faced with a terrible act, an, an act which involved, as he put it, beautiful babies and children and women. Um, he issued a strong condemnation. The Secretary of State issued a strong condemnation. But then you got to a point of saying, okay, how's that different from Barack Obama? And if he had done nothing by this weekend, all the talk shows would have been that he's as weak as Obama. And so I think uh, he uh, calmly had um, General uh, H.R. McMaster and, and uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis figure out an appropriate combat capability for a direct, immediate, relatively narrow strike. And as he had said all through the campaign, the key is not to announce it. Let it happen, then describe it. Uh, and I thought it was very telling that... Uh, they didn't negotiate or ask the Russians for permission. They told the Russians on a military-to-military -military basis, uh, we're coming in, you need to get out of the way. Uh, and the Russians did get out of the way. So yeah. uh, I thought it was uh, as a first step. It reminded me a great deal in the newsletter I'm writing today um, at Gingrich Productions is, is on the, the parallel between uh, what happened with Ronald Reagan in the Gulf of Sidra, where we shot down two Libyan aircraft and sending a signal that we were back, and what Trump did this week in sending a signal that we're back. In both cases, you have presidents following weak liberal Democrats who talked a lot but did nothing. And in both cases, it sent a signal to the world of action, not just talk. And I think in that sense that Trump has probably rattled a lot of people. Well, I think it was certainly North Korea, China, certainly Iran was watching. Here's what's fascinating. I want you to answer this question after I play these cuts for you. Through the prism of the promises that the president, then President Obama, made about this horrible deal with the Iranians, that this will prevent them from getting nuclear weapons. Because I'm going to play back to back here, both Barack Obama and John Kerry saying that President Assad of Syria got rid of chemical weapons because of the red line. Listen to both of them. And by the way, Susan Rice even said it, but we'll just play these two. I, I think it was important for me as president of the United States to send a message that, in fact, there is something different about chemical weapons. Uh, and regardless of how it ended up playing, I think, uh, in the Beltway, what is true is Assad got rid of his chemical weapons. And the reason he got rid of them is for a because... While. Well, look, uh, if 90% or 95% of those uh, chemical uh, stockpiles were eliminated, that's a lot of chemical weapons that are not right now in the hands of ISIL or Nusra or, for that matter, the regime. The president made his decision to strike. He announced his decision to strike publicly. And the purpose of the strike was to get the chemical weapons out of Syria. That's the purpose. We achieved a deal with the Russians that didn't wind up in two days of strikes that would have sent a, quote, message, but would not have removed the weapons. We struck a deal to get all of the declared weapons out of Syria. Never before in a conflict has that ever happened, that during a conflict, weapons of mass destruction are taken out of the zone of conflict. And thank God we did that, because if we hadn't done that today, ISIL would have those chemical weapons in large parts of the country. Very telling how wrong they were. Now let's assume that they're wrong on Iran for a minute and the Iranians, mullahs, uh, radical Islamists get nuclear weapons because of this ridiculous deal using the billions that Obama gave them. Look, I think that, uh, first of all, one of the things I think that motivated uh, Trump and motivated uh, his team was that both the Syrians and the Russians had lied. Remember, the Syrians had promised that they'd gotten rid of all the chemical weapons. The Russians promised that they had investigated. And in a sense, the Russians uh, put their honor on the line and said, trust us, uh, we're telling you that the Syrians are now free of chemical weapons. So you had clear evidence that both governments had lied. You then had this terrible attack uh, killing children and babies and, and, and women. Um, and, and sarin gas is a horrible way to die. Uh, and so... Um, I think it was in that context that they operated. There, there are two parts. This one is liberals have a capacity to lie to themselves endlessly uh, about reality. 
whether it is Chamberlain lying about Adolf Hitler, uh, whether it is the Clinton administration lying about North Korea, uh, this this willful self-deception, and of course the the Iranian dishonesty uh, dwarfs the uh, Syrian dishonesty in terms of uh, John Kerry and Barack Obama just being totally dis. You know, I think they probably lie to themselves. I think they may even believe the lies uh, because they're, they're so deeply embedded in their psyche. Uh, but what you have now, and I thought it was a fascinating week, you, you, you had, uh, the president of Egypt come in, you had the king of Jordan come in, meeting with the president, talking about the Middle East, you know both those conversations included Assad, included Syria, you have the president taking a decisive action, uh, he, he takes it and announces it while he is in dinner, in, involved with, uh, the, uh, Chinese prime, prime minister who's there for dinner. Uh, so, to whatever degree the Chinese wanted to sign- signal that the U.S. was back and that we were strong and that we were doing things, it could hardly have been more vivid. Um, and I think you'll notice that around the world there have been very positive reaction. Saudi Arabia has been positive. Jordan has been positive. Turkey has been positive. Most of the Europeans have been positive. Egypt has been positive. So there's a, there's a pretty big referendum. The Iraqis came out today and were positive. There's been a pretty big referendum saying... You know, if you're not Syria, Russia, or North Korea, you pro- or Iran, you probably think this is a pretty good idea. All right, well, hang on. We'll continue more with Speaker Gingrich on the other side of this break here as we continue on this Friday. All right, as we continue with former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich is with us. Um, your reaction to some of the other news that's going on today. Neil Gorsuch, of course, the constitutional option used by Mitch McConnell and, and the Republicans in the Senate. I give them a lot of credit for standing up to what was the first partisan filibuster in over 200 years on a Supreme Court justice. Well, so, by the way, you know what's really funny? Schumer closes out, and the Wall Street Journal did a great job with an editorial on this. He closes out his final speech talking about the, the bipartisanship of the founding fathers. Well, Jefferson presides over the Senate for four years as the vice president. Jefferson writes Jefferson's manual, which is the original rule book of parliamentary procedure. In Jefferson's era, there was no cloture. It was all done by simple majority. And in fact, Jefferson, we are told, uh, during this period they didn't keep records, so we don't know for sure, but we are told that if you talk too long, Jefferson would simply rule that you weren't being germane and shut you up. I mean, it, right. so when, when people say, oh, Look at the filibuster. I'm writing a piece on this for next Tuesday as my, my newsletter next Tuesday. That it, because it turns out it is Calhoun in defense of slavery who develops the filibuster, not until 1841. What do you and think of getting rid of cloture as it relates to legislative movement in the Senate? I favor it. I, Me too. I didn't favor it until I started doing this historical research. The concept of a supermajority to end debate occurs in 1917 from from. 1789 to 1917, we did not have the requirement for a supermajority. In 1917, they formalized the system. It's lasted exactly 100 years, and frankly, it's made it very hard for the Senate to function. Now, I know the senators won't like that because they're used to the the relative power that it gives individual senators. But from the country standpoint, I think it might be good to go back to operating the way it did under Jefferson. And I said, ironically, you know, it's Schumer who's quoting the founding fathers because he doesn't know anything about history, but the founding fathers had a Senate, which operated on a simple majority. But, you know, you know, the great irony in all of that is you got Schumer all over the place, depending on, on who's in power at any particular moment. So, But you know what? The Democrats don't play by the same rules. I mean, Republicans, they they allow an up or down vote for somebody like Elena Kagan or Sonia Sotomayor or Ruth Bader Ginsburg, knowing they're getting a left-wing radical activist on the court. That same courtesy is not extended to the Republicans, so I don't think they have any option. Democrats don't play fair, don't play by the same rules, so any argument that, well, this is going to come back to haunt you is meaningless, but it would really alter the legislative side of this if, in fact, they could do health care without worrying about reconciliation or needing cloture, right? Well, that's exactly right. And by the way, an easy way to think of it is this. Republicans look for principles to explain rules. The Democrats look for power to explain rules. So Democrats change rules to fit the needs of power. The Republicans get trapped into arcane arguments about about principle that have no relationship to power. So one of the places that I am most offended by the Senate rules is the whole idea of reconciliation for health care. That, that simple principle that you have to fit under some weird straitjacket in order to pass something with, with 50 votes plus the vice president, that 
principal has totally screwed up trying to write a serious health bill because they keep trying to fit it uh, into an arcane Washington legislative mess that simply doesn't work. And all of it's a myth. It doesn't have to be that way. I keep hearing that there's these ongoing negotiations as it relates to health care, and they might be close to a deal. Um, it's not going to be ideal, especially from the, my perspective. Um, but at this point, is it something you start and then begin the process of making it better and better, or is it better to wait and, and as you say, take away the, the whole cloture debate and issue altogether? Well, if, if, I mean, I'd like to get it done as quickly as possible for a lot of different reasons, one of which is just that as Obamacare keeps collapsing, it's going to hurt more and more people. I mean, there are, there are now entire communities that have no effective insurance, and, and uh, so there's a very profound reason to try to get this thing fixed. But at the same time, I would say to conservatives, it is never going to get better than the House bill. You're not going to go to the Senate under the current rules and get a better deal than you're going to get in the House. So uh, conservatives need to be aware of that, and they need to think very carefully, because the end game is not the House, it's not even the Senate. The end game is a conference committee of the two bodies to send something back that can then be passed by both bodies and go to the President. Unless you think about that first, yeah. you have no idea what, what you're dealing in. All right, Mr. Speaker, are you back from vacation or are you still on vacation working? Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm busy with work right here in Washington, D.C. Oh, I'm glad you're back. Well, hopefully we'll see you tonight on TV. Yeah, uh, Mr. Speaker, to. thank you so much. 800 one Sean.